roughly 400 feet off of Guilford's coast, where the East River meets Guilford Harbor, lies a curious parcel of land named Grass Island. This piece of land, while part of Guilford, shares a land border with Madison and holds an iconic landmark included in the town's repertoire of historical buildings. I am of course talking about the celebrated Red Shack. The turn of the century cottage has had many roles in its 110 year old life from a family summer getaway to a gathering point for the community. From a summer spot to a beloved subject of innumerable amounts of artwork, the structure has built for itself a place in the town's hearts, memories, and minds. The Red Shack has a fascinating history, and I spoke with town historian Joel Helander to tell its tale. Hello, my name is Joel Helander, and I'm the town historian for Guilford, Connecticut, and have served in that capacity since 1990. Um... I've been living in Guilford all my life. I'm the 10th or 11th generation to be here. My forebears in town were the Bentons, Leets, Nortons, and other families. Uh, as town historian, I do consulting with others. I've uh, prepared booklets and books and um, <clears throat> stories over the years in writing. And uh, my specialty really is land use and origins of buildings. Uh, therefore, it uh, may not surprise one that I've always been interested in the Grass Island Shack in Guilford. Let's call it the Grass Island Cottage, is more properly it should be known by. Anytime I undertake um, a historical analysis or historical study of a house in Guilford or land in Guilford, they always start with a title search. And the Guilford land records, the venerable Guilford land records in Town Hall, uh, are very complete and very well indexed uh, back to actually 1645, not the founding of the town, but to 1645. We lost the earlier records. So a title search such as I've done some years ago reveals that, that um, Grass Island was originally called Sandy Point, and the 18th century land records continually uh, up until the uh, late uh, 19th century, referred to it as Sandy Point and then, or Grass Island. But uh, Sandy Point or Grass Island was common and undivided land. Nobody owned it until 1730. And that was the year, 1730 and 1731, that the town... Uh, granted or quote-unquote laid out Sandy Point to a private owner. And the first private owner was Sam Hill. Now, you've probably heard of the expression running like Sam Hill, which is a uh, has been adopted nationwide over the years. Yes, there was really a Sam Hill. He was born in Guilford in the 17th century. He lived on Boston Street. And uh, Sam Hill was active in Guilford civic affairs. He was a probate judge for a while, he was town clerk for a while, and he ran for the state legislature. And he owned um, uh, Grass Island uh, or Sandy Point, f f he and his uh, successive generations for three generations. Now one might wonder, why would anybody want to own uh, windswept, isolated, Sandy Point or Grass Island in the 18th century? Well, I have one explanation. Guilford was a farming town. Uh, everybody was a subsistence farmer, and uh, Sam Hill uh, was no exception to that. He, he was a farmer, a subsistence farmer, and he used Sandy Point or Grass Island for sand as a resource, for seaweed. Sometimes seaweed was known as sea manure, and sea manure... Uh, was used to fertilize crops, not notably corn. Uh, it was also a place for gathering shells. Um, great banks of shells still wash up on Grass Island to this day. And shells could sometimes be burned to make kind of a mortar or plaster for building uh, for the masonry in early homes. And uh, so there were natural resources there that were used. Now, after Sam Hill... Um, 
after three generations of his family, believe it or not, a selectman in Guilford named Ralph Parker uh, owned uh, Sandy Point or Grass Island with no buildings on it for maybe close to 10 years. And the Parkers uh, ended up selling the place in 1914 to the druggist J. Harrison Monroe. When was the cottage built and by whom? The Grass Island Cottage, uh, according to the grandson of the man who had it built, uh, Brad Monroe of Vermont, who now is an octogenarian uh, up in his 80s, told me about 30 years ago that it was built by a carpenter named William Hill, a boat builder, for uh, Brad Monroe's grandfather, who was a local druggist, J. Harrison Monroe. And that would have been in the year 1914 when the Monroe family acquired the property. Now we're told that the original cottage burned down around 1936 as a result of a brush fire. And it was rebuilt perhaps around 1940. Do we know about the main builder there and his use of the shack? Was it recreational? What, like our summer retreat or something like that? I understand from Brad Monroe, a junior who is in Vermont, that it was more or less a family getaway. Um, kind of a place for overnight camping and picnicking. Um, the family lit the little cottage with kerosene lanterns. And... Uh, it really was always very rustic and, if anything, primitive. Uh, according to Mr. Monroe, uh, they did have an outhouse on the premises, and uh, he spent many, many summers there overnight. And now you touched on this earlier. The original structure was destroyed by fire in 36 and rebuilt in 1940. Was the you know the same design? They just rebuilt it by image, or was there? Do we know it? It was the same type of structure. I don't. Unfortunately, we don't have any photographs of the cottage uh, on Grass Island prior to that fire. Although it wouldn't surprise me if the Monroe family did. One can only assume uh, that what's there now uh, is pretty much the same. Uh, in, in construction style and appearance. I think it does bear mentioning, however, that uh, over the years it's been rehabbed and renovated so many times that uh, in having just examined the cottage uh, a few days ago, I think it's, it's largely been replaced and replicated. I think very little uh, of the Monroe Cottage on Grass Island survives from the circa 1940 building. And it was moved to its current location on Grass Island in 1950. Do we know where the initial location was? I'm told before the fire, according to Brad Monroe Jr., our informant uh, on the history of this um, little iconic cottage, that originally it stood a great deal west uh, of where it stands now. And... Uh, Again, because of the Atlantic tide rise, which adversely affects Long Island Sound as well, uh, at some point, uh, perhaps around in the 1950s, it, it was moved back and over to the north and east to, to where it is now, set up on piers. Was it donated or sold to the town in 1963? Actually, the town of Guilford acquired Grass Island as we know it uh, in 1965. Uh, it was deeded to the town by uh, members of the Monroe family. And at that time, it was only seven acres. And then over the years, the town acquired additional acreage, bringing the total parcel now up to approximately 32 acres. And uh, the original purchase price was $15,000. And it had to uh, be approved the town meeting uh, that's uh, chronicled in the Shoreline Times as well. There were a few dissenting votes, believe it or not, but uh, overwhelmingly the town thought that it would be a, 
uh, a great place for passive recreation and uh, an investment to have some shorefront. Do we know why it was don donated or sold? They just not want the family not want to manage the upkeep or have the property. You know, um, Matt, I'm not sure why they sold it. I assume that in 1965, uh, the Guilford Land Trust had been um, had been established, and uh, Guilford at that point in time was. Uh, very aware of its cultural resources, both in open spaces and in buildings. And uh, they realized the infinite wisdom of acquiring properties, especially beachfront. Uh, around that same time, Jacobs Beach had been acquired as well. So I, I think the reason the town was so interested, again, is not only because of passive recreation, but because of its location. Uh, right at the headwater of I shouldn't say headwater, at the mouth of East River uh, in, in Guilford Harbor, such as it might be called, um, right opposite the, the town marina premises. After several decades, the shack was neglected, but it was restored by, with fundraising organized by Richard Wirral in 1996. First of all, do we know why the building itself was neglected? Oh, for almost a 30 or so year period? Well, you know, Matt, in, in, uh, <clears throat> in my 70 some years of living in Guilford, uh, I can recollect the Grass Island shack or cottage, if you will, having been rehabbed or renovated at least three times. And I think we have to realize it's in a very harsh environment to begin with. Um, it's not a true island, of course, but it's a promontory, uh, an isolated windswept promontory uh, subjected to winds in all directions. And th the base of the so-called Grass Island is, is all sand. So it's uh, subjected to harsh wa wash and erosion. Um, I can recall, and I think the Shoreline Times newspapers uh, makes a record of this. The first uh, rehab that I recall was in 1982, and that's been written up in the Shoreline Times. Um, at that time, the town considered the uh, Monroe Cottage to be a quote-unquote an attractive nuisance, and there was uh, a number of uh, town officials recommend, recommended that it be demolished. Well, that's when we realized that Guilford uh, protects its historic buildings and uh, considered this uh, worthy of preservation. And, and the hue and cry was heard, we must save uh, the Monroe Cottage. And that was in 82. And from what I understand, the Guilford Preservation Alliance, which had just been formed uh, around that time, 81, 82, stepped up to the plate and the Guilford Rotary Club and other organizations. And uh, they more or less stepped it, st uh, stabilized it. But then you mentioned in 96, there was another uh, grand effort um, led by Richard Worley of the Guilford Boat Owners Association. And the, um, <clears throat> they had a, <clears throat> a cry, SOS, Save Our Shack. <laughs> and word went out and nonprofit organizations all over town, various agencies stepped forward with money and uh, volunteer work um, to provide services. So that was the second restoration. And then, of course, the third was uh, only recently in 2016 when the remarkable uh, John Markowski, as a candidate for Eagle Scout, made it his project. And again, uh, the town rallied in a large way with all of its various nonprofit groups, and everybody stepped forward, and it was rehabbed yet again. So every 10 or 15 years or so, it, it really needs attention. Now, was this structure be slowly becoming a town icon over the period of decades, or was it started during these initial rushes of donations to realize mm -hmm. that it was an iconic part of Guilford? Well, <clears throat> I would assume that since there has been a shack or cottage 
on Grass Island since approximately 1914, that people have known it and revered it as a visual aesthetic on not only the uh, landscape, but on the soundscape. So I'm believing that as time went on, uh, people identified with it more and more and more. And uh, the Monroe Cottage on Grass Island really offers more than just a visual um, aesthetic, uh, but it, it really creates kind of heritage tourism, uh, not in the sense that it's a, it's a museum and not in the sense that it's easily accessible. Uh, it's not easily accessible. However, um, it offers passive recreation because at the, at the mouth of the East River, kayaks, canoes, and boats can pull up on the berm of sand very easily and beach for a picnic and um, swimming and fishing. Um, for many years, the Guilford Boat Owners Association, uh, GBOA, uh, held clam bakes there. Uh, on any given summer's day, uh, it's, it's a congregating place for uh, boaters and those intrepid souls who want to come in by foot from the end of Neck Road. It's a three-quarter mile trek each way, but people do uh, trek in from the end of Neck Road. Erosion is a, and sea level is a constant battle. Have you heard any of the ideas to fight fight this? Well, there's quite a bit of debate on the Atlantic sea rise. Um, my understanding that in the look back, um, the Atlantic sea rise is about three millimeters a year in, in this portion of Connecticut in the Sound. That translates to about a foot per century, and that sounds minuscule, but when you take a vertical foot sea rise every 100 years uh, and translate that to upland that it takes horizontally, um, it, it really is, is, is quite extraordinary how much land is taken through the recession, coastal resilience as they would call it. So the, the remedy to move it back to higher ground makes good sense. It's going to be a project and a half, but I think the town uh, fathers and mothers uh, with all their infinite wisdom are to be saluted for uh, <clears throat> their investigation in the ways and means of doing it. And I'm not sure that a, uh, the ways and means have been exactly um, determined yet, but certainly they're taking it very seriously. Because of the cottage's impact on the community, it has become the subject of many works of art in various mediums. The Red Shack stands as an example of Guilford's rich history and vibrant community. From its beginnings as a family retreat to its current status as a beloved landmark and muse for countless artists, the Red Shack has woven itself into the tapestry of Guilford's unique identity. Despite facing threats from rising sea levels, the town's dedication to preserving this icon ensures its place in the hearts and memories of residents and visitors for generations to come.